it will be covered later on this day but in order to uh, make on time the lab which we are in the second half of the gamut we have to start with this lecture too so i hope uh, you cope up with this and uh, lecture one timing will be informed in the second half okay okay, okay. and we have about an hour yes yes okay very good so <coughs> well welcome everyone uh, hope you enjoyed the uh, opening this morning the uh, this lecture is going to take you through the uh, basic aspects of gamut and globe K. Uh, and then um, at the end of the lecture, we also have some material on Unix, et cetera. Uh, in one hour, I am not going to get through all of that material. The lecture notes are available to so, so some of the material at the end of the class on Unix and stuff, that might be stuff that's best read by you. So we'll start here. Page up. That's not advancing. It's the page button. Oh, well, I can always use the buttons. Just okay. Uh, I will use the laser pointer. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. So what we're going to talk about for the lecture today, the basic outline of what we're going to deal with, is we're going to start looking at gamut and globe K and some of the ancillary programs that go with them. Uh, the package themselves are actually made up of many different programs and many different what are called shell scripts. And shell scripts are just a simple way of programming that is used in these native languages of this of the Unix system. So it's it's basically a programming language, but it's uh, it's a little text file. You can actually read it, and once you sort of can speak that language, it's pretty obvious what it's doing. It's like almost looking at source code, the original. So we'll look at some of those. We'll look at the information that you need for each of these types of programs. This package is designed to do sub-millimeter positioning over long distances. And when you're dealing with that level of accuracy, submillimeter is less than the width of your fingernail. And when you're doing that, you need lots of external information. We'll talk about what you need to be able to do that, etc. And then we'll look at the methods that we use to automate the processes. One of the important things to remember are the developments in the last decade or so is there are now something like 10,000 high precision GPS receivers, dual frequency running that can do sub-millimeter position, 10,000 of those sites around the world. And many of those we process. We typically process about 350 of those every week to do the IGS, contribute to the IGS orbits for the satellites. We also work with a large network in the US of about 2,000 stations. So it has to be automated. And then that's the whole idea of the system is that once you get it running, you can automate it and then rapidly do more processing, do larger networks, et cetera. That's the concept. So the basics that we have, we talk about gamut and globe K. Uh, gamut itself means GPS at MIT. That's where the name came from. GPS, the gamut side of the process, takes the raw or close to the raw data that comes from the receivers and typically is processed in 24-hour batches of data and generates positions for those individual days for some group of stations. Generally, we restrict it to less than 80 stations at one time. And as we look at the package, we'll see why it has to do with the way the combinations are formed and the size of the process. So Gamut generates the positions and then other parameter estimates, which we won't focus on much this week. We're going to focus on positions to do tectonics, but it also generates atmospheric delay estimates. There's also clock information potentially that comes out as well, which are for more specialized processes. So this is done on individual days of data with relatively small numbers of data. Globe K is the program, it stands for Global Kalman Filter. And it's the program which actually combines lots of different data together. 
And the idea, if you think about a scenario, you're interested in the tectonics in this region, you're going to be collecting data for a number of years. And over that number of years, the stations will be moving relative to each other. And they will be moving relative to the rest of the world. So the gamut processing will take essentially each day of data that you have, and you will run that many, many times on each of the days that you make measurements for this multiple year period of time. So you have lots and lots of individual days. Globe K is the program we use to take all of that data and combine it all together to determine things like velocity fields, how fast things are moving, that determines how do I want to represent my motions? Because if you think about India, maybe you want to look at the convergence of India to Eurasia. So in that scenario, you might want to have Eurasia as the place that's not moving very much, and India, you see how it's moving towards it. But you may be more interested in a local problem in India. And so there, you may want India to be basically stationary, and you look at this local process. Maybe you've got a subsidence problem someplace, and you want to look at that. So Globe K is the program that lets you do those final decisions of this is what I want to look at relative to that. That's what actually makes Globe K somewhat more complicated than Gamut, because Globe K is where you make decisions on how you want to do things. And so that's where we generate, essentially, our final scientific results. So the overall flow of this system is that we have this sort of flow. There's a pre-processing step. The pre-processing is you need to get the files that you need. Now, what actually comes out of a GPS receiver is actually a raw binary format that's typically proprietary to each one of the manufacturers. One of the pre-processing steps is to have that converted to a form which is much more widely accepted, and that form is called RINEX, Receiver Independent Exchange Format. There's a couple of versions of it at the moment, but most data are available in what's called RINEX 2, the second, the second version of the format. And so the pre-processing is getting that data into the RINEX form. You also need to worry about what was the antenna used at the site? Because the antennas are not point positions. They actually have a phase pattern, a phase variation associated with them, which you have to account for. That has to be done at the gamut stage. If you get it incorrect, you say that I used brand X antenna when really I used a different one, then you're going to get the wrong answer out of your solution. But it's going to be subtly wrong. That's part of the problem. It won't be 100 meters away. It may be 2 millimeters off or 3 millimeters off. And when you're looking at tectonic motions of a few millimeters per year, that's a serious error that you have to worry about. So the pre-processing is making sure you get that information correct. It turns out you also need to get the type of receiver correct because of the way the internal tracking loops work. That turns out to be actually an easier task because the data files are written by the receiver, and the receiver writes into the data files, typically, what it is. And so you can actually automatically extract that. The antenna is attached at the end of a coaxial cable. And in general, the receiver does not know what the antenna is that it's connected to. It just wants to know that there's signal coming from it. And so as a result, the antenna is always the more subtle problem. If you are doing measurements where you're doing occupations of sites, it's called campaign survey. You have to know what the height of the antenna is, et cetera. And so there's all this pre-processing just to make sure you get correct. Then the gamut step is where you actually process the phase data. Um, and that's usually multiple days, years of data. And this essentially is the conversion from that raw data that came out of the receiver into a set of information, mainly coordinates of stations, and other things that we can then later on process in more detail later on. So, you, so you, here you loop the gamut for all of the data that you have, and then typically you put it into globe K. And there's a couple of things you want to do there. Is one is this issue I said of what's called the reference frame definition. Do you want to see how things are moving relative to Eurasia, or whether Eurasia is moving relative to India? Do you want to look at a local system? Do you want to do something even smaller in scale? Maybe part, maybe you want to do your own plate for India 
And so you want to look at those different things. That's the sort of decision that you do. You can get that frame definition. Globe K also is the way we generate time series. So at some point I said, oh, we know these things to better than a half a millimeter. How do you know that? Well, the typical way you do that is you look at the time series, the evolution of the points as a function of time, and you look at how well do they actually match, maybe a straight line, but if you've had a big earthquake, like the Sumatra earthquake back a number of years ago, which affected much of the Indian subcontinent, um, there's actually post-seismic deformation that occurs after that. That's another thing Globe K is able to handle and you have to worry about. So you think about that time series generation. And then the analysis. And this is the bit we're not going to teach you. And this is the hardest part, is how do you take those results and work out what do they mean? What do I infer from this? What can I tell about this? And again, that is all wrapped up in how you do the processing. Those two are intimately linked, depending on what the problem is you want to do with. So you have this complexity of analysis. And as I said, this is what makes the globe K portion difficult. Because it is where all these decisions need to be made. You have to understand the types of decisions you can make, and then how you want to apply them for your particular process. And that's, again, it's a learning experience. That's why I said earlier in today that you will come away with this for some things now, but it's not till time later on that you actually start really working out how to get all this worked out. And we can do the simple ones today, but there's much more complexity as we go forward with time. Okay, so Gamut Basics. Uh, it is, Gamut, as I said, is a suite of programs. Uh, and it takes GPS and GNSS uh, observations of phase, which have an accuracy of a few millimeters, or a precision of a few millimeters. And we also use range, but we use that to get clocks, etc. And it's a weighted least squares estimation. Uh, and it estimates positions. That's the main thing you're interested in. But it also does satellite orbits, uh, Earth orientation parameters, what's called the ambiguities, the phase ambiguities at the beginning, and atmospheric delays. Depending on what you're doing, much of the time, you are going to take orbits from someplace else and just keep them as uh, fixed quantities that are known because they're done by a large international group that generates very high precision orbits. But you also have that capability of doing orbits if you want to sort of go down that exploration of how you might deal with that. The, uh, in addition, you need this Rhinex data, as we said, and there's a lot of external files that we will come back to. And again, a typical processing unit is 24 hours of data uh, 30 to 50 sites. Sometimes you can have shorter spans of data, um, and so it depends. But if you're doing campaign measurements, for example, it's often convenient to only be at a location, say, for 12 hours, and then you move. Uh, and so most of the time, but much of what we do is based on a 24-hour unit of data. So Globe K, again, Globe K is actually a suite of programs, and they take results from Gamut there's a file output by Gamut. We're just going to call them H files. Um, again, when you deal Gamut, uh, there's certain file names. So we just, the first letter of the name <laughs> says what the file is. And this goes back to the original development of Gamut when the um, number of characters you could have in a file name was just six characters. So you're pretty stingy in how you name the things. And so you'll hear we'll say things like X files and O files and L files. And those are just different types of files. It's a bit the same way as you have an extent on a file, like a .txt for text and uh, .xls for Excel, etc. It's that same motion, except it's the first character. So anyway, from Gamut, the solution, the thing that is used in Globe K is called the H file. But Globe K also, one of its powers, is it can take results from other people's software. The Bernese software, for example, the Gypsy software, uh, even satellite laser ranging data and, and VOBI results as well. And those things tend to get distributed these days in a file called Sinex, which is solution independent exchange format. And we can read those into Globe K. Uh, and Globe K itself is a common filter. We'll talk briefly about that as to the implications of a common filter versus a uh, weighted least squares approach. Um, so in addition to that, uh, Globe K itself, 
uh, requires a couple of other files that it needs. And one of those is what's called the control file that tells Glocane how you, what you want it to do. And, uh, and we'll contrast that with the way Gamut sort of does a similar thing in the way it sets up as we go across. And then you need information about some a priori information, like the coordinates, so the initial positions where you think the sites are, etc. So Glocay itself can process a single day of data for time series analysis, or it can process many years of data and generate position and velocity estimates by combining it all together. And then once it's combined, giving you the flexibility to rotate that and translate that into a reference frame of your choice once you've completed at the end of that. And again, precisely what you do here really depends on your scientific aims of your processing. Okay, so the structure when you actually install this software. Uh, they all get installed under a common directory. For our own convenience, uh, we, and this is a Unix thing, uh, it's convenient to know precisely what the name of the place is that you've stored. So since everyone likes to install things under their own name, we create an alias to that name. And that alias is called GG. And part of the installation instructions is you create this alias in your home directory that points to where the software is actually installed. And so when I have on my Mac, for example, I have the last six versions of the software under their own names, and I just have to change the GG link to run different versions of the software if I wish to. Uh, as we go through. So what you get when you install the software is there's a directory called ggcom, and com stands for command files. And this is where we put all of the different scripts that we use. These are all the little things that help you bring this package together. So as I said, when you do gamut, you're actually running many different programs. And you can run that in sequence if you wish to, but nobody does that anymore. And so what we run is a thing called shgamut. And SH just stands for shell, tells you that it's a shell script. And it's an SH gamut. And it, once you've got it set up, does everything for you. It creates the directories you need. It will go to FTP and get the files you need. And you just have to give it the guidelines as to what to do. So the other thing about our software, I must admit, is it does need a good internet connection. Um, and so we'll find that out. Um, we do a lot of FTP in of stuff, and so uh, when you're setting up, if you do have FTP issues, sometimes it's more convenient to actually do things separately beforehand, bring in the information so you know it's there, and then once you've got it, you can run SH gamut, for example. Play with that, and I'm certain. So this is where those shell scripts are, and then there's a gamut bin uh, under Unix, typically the executable programs are put in a bin directory. Uh, actually, I'm not sure where they put them in Windows systems. And in Macs, they put them under applications these days. But the equivalent of that, this is where the executables are located. And there's a gamut bin and a KF bin for the common filter. Globe K is under the common filter one. And as I said, GG is this link to your home directory. So once you have um, installed the software, you then typically want to go out and look at what data you want to process and it's usually over some interval of time. And then you use SH gamut for processing that daily data. Uh, again, when you're doing something like, say, the Indian stations here, you want to look around first to find, well, what are the external stations that I want to use? And there's this group called the International GPS Service, or GNSS Service, IGS. Who's heard of IGS? Some people have heard of IGS. OK, you'll learn more about them. Um, it's actually an, an amazing collaboration that's been going on now for uh, a couple of decades, but it is the auspices at which we get extremely high precision orbits for the satellites. Much higher precision than the military ever generates for GPS, much higher precision than anything else generates. And it's all done through this collaboration of a lot of academic and government agencies around the world. That's where many of those 10,000 GPS stations there's about four or 500 of those, which are called IGS stations. They are designed to do the satellite orbits. So when you do a regional network, you generally go and try to find where those stations are. And IGS is based at IGS.org, www.IGS.org. And you can look at their stations, and that's what we were doing last night, to work out what would be good stations to use around India for the moment. 
So those are the decisions you make at the beginning, and having decided that, things generally become much easier after that. So again, uh, once you've done the gamut processing, uh, then Globe-K is used uh, to combine results together and set the reference frame that we want to use. And um, when you install Gamut, for those of you who want to play with it, there's actually an example case given in the installation software. That example tar file, there's actually two of them, one with and without FTP needed. So if you do really have bad FTP programs, but you can get the example, you can download the example that has all of the files in it that it needs, and then you don't need FTP anymore after that. Uh, but you should run through that example. It has a, a workflow, step through, step by step. Do this, change this, do this. And if you work your way through that and look at what's happening, you'll get a good sense of going from individual days of data to a complete VK velocity solution with maps generated of that solution at the end using the graphics program called GMT, the generic mapping tool. So it, uh, I highly recommend that you do that. We will actually do the equivalent of the example here this week but using your own data as well. Well, cross fingers, that's what we're hoping we will do. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and again, this whole thing shows you about the script control. Okay, so again, that basic strategies we're doing here with Globe K processing, the, again, depending on what data you, you have, Trimble receivers, uh, Trimble's output a particular binary format. Trimble actually supplies this program called runpkr00, great name. <laughs> Not sure what it means. Uh, but anyway, that allows you to convert the raw binary from Trimble into another binary format, which is less proprietary of Trimble's. And then there's a program called TEQC, which you can get from UNAVCO. We do not distribute that because it's not our software, but everybody in the world pretty much uses it. And that, this TEQC program, it's uh, translate, uh, I've heard the E stands for now, translate something and quality control. But it basically, the translate is the bit that you're interested in. That generates Rhinex files. So then, this gets you your Rhinex files. Then in the gamut processing, you're doing lots of things, but the basic step that's happening here is there's a program that runs, it's called model. And when you run this as your screen, if you watch what's coming out on your screen, you'll see each of these modules run. The standard way we do this processing, you don't individually run these things. It all gets controlled under a batch system. Uh, but if you watch what's happening, you'll see these names come out. A model is the thing which takes the phase data and all the a priori information you give it, and it calculates what we would have theoretically observed for the phase values had we known exactly where everybody, where the stations were, where all the orbits were, everything in there. We don't know that, but it's the, it's the model part of the calculation for your least squares estimation. Now, of course, GPS data is never clean. There's always what are called cycle slips. We're doing a phase tracking. Who remembers what the wavelength of GPS is for phase? It's about 240 millimeters, approximately. And so uh, there's a couple of different frequencies there. But it's uh, only about this amount. And as it's tracking the phase, it can lose count of that number of cycles, and that's called a cycle slip. Sometimes the receivers just actually completely blow it on tracking the satellites and generate completely vague, wrong values. Sometimes there's gaps in the data. So the program that tries to put all the data back into what are called clean data, where the cycle slips have been removed, etc., it's a program called AutoClean. And then uh, the program which then takes that observed values, the computed values, cleaned to remove the cycle slips and resolve, uh, um, you know, get rid of any bad data. The program that combines that together is a weighted least squares program called Solve. And so you'll see this run, and then this repeats. One of the unique things in the way we run Gamut, as opposed to many other packages, is we actually do one full solution, and then based on that solution, come back and refine this whole model and in particular get the data noise statistics. And so we do this twice, actually. And so that, uh, and if there's a problem in the solution, it may well actually do it a third time trying to correct it. This sequence, again, is aimed at trying to get your solution through. And if something goes wrong, it tries to correct the problems for you. And there's warning messages pointed out. So one of the important things to 
look at is some of the status files that come out because sometimes you will find that it got the solution, but to do that, it had to throw out all the data from your station. And that's not very useful to you. And if you're not paying attention, because this tends to get batch run, you might not even notice that. And then finally you do your Globe K multi-year solution, and all of a sudden you don't find any of your sites. And then you have to go back, whoa, what happened? And you go all the way back and you find there was something wrong in the original processing. So understanding the status files that come out of these programs uh, and the summaries. We try to highlight this to you in the summaries to let you know this has happened. But this is an important thing to do. So you do, um, gamut. This output, there's a particular file called these H files that are output from gamut. And then we do time series and velocity seals generation. We use two differently named programs, um, which actually confuses people. Globe K, you typically run when you want to generate uh, velocity solutions. There's another program called GLRED, which is what people typically use to do time series analysis. But GLRED is not a separate program. All GLRED does is it, in an automatic fashion, sets up a whole series of Globe K runs for you to do each of those individual days. So it is still, GeoRed is just actually a small little program that allows you to essentially batch up a big run of Globe K. And these days, I must admit, <clears throat> we might well have actually done GeoRed as a shell script rather than as, a, um, as its own individual program. Uh, again, this goes back, the original development of Globe K uh, was actually not on, a was not on a Unix system, it was actually on a, a HP um, proprietary operating system which got ported to Unix. So when it was developed, the whole idea of shell scripting and things really wasn't involved. That's why GeoRed is actually its own little program. But it is basically just a convenient way to do it. And then finally you end up again with your analysis step. And if everything works out well, you don't have to go back to this gamut stage after you've based on your analysis. If you been paying attention to what you're doing. Okay, so the basic inputs and outputs that you need for this stuff is a Rhinox data, they must be prepared for input to gamut. Generally, you will have your own Rhinox data, and then as I said, the other Rhinox for stations around you, which will help you define how your stations are moving, those you get from international archives. And we have a whole stack of um, different archives that we can collect data from and understand what's going on. So the, the main output from gamut that is used for tectonic is these things called H files. These are loosely con what we call loosely constrained solutions. What that simply means is that the station coordinates aren't particularly constrained to anything themselves. It allows us later on in Globe K to be able to move the reference frames of those coordinates around. An amazing thing with GPS processing is that when you take a GPS uh, processing and you just keep all the stations loose. The individual station coordinates are very poorly determined. But if you look at the distances between the stations, what's called the baseline lengths, the distances between the stations are very well determined. And what that means is that distances between points, if you think about coordinate systems, are invariant to rotations and translations of the reference frame. So it's that baseline length. In some senses, that's really what Globe K is using to reconstruct your network. There's all the site separations that are there. And so those are output into these files called H files, which again, you don't know in detail, they're, uh, they're sort of readable, uh, but they have massive covariance matrices in them, so they tend to be quite. So the, these ASCII H files get converted for uh, use of Globe K into a binary format. The reason we do that is to make them smaller and also so we can actually have direct access on the file, so we can read individual parts of the file. That is actually done with a program called h to global This h to global program also converts other types of files into this binary, the SINEX files. We'll briefly touch on that during the class, but we won't talk much about it. And if you're using this shell script called shgeo-red, which is sort of the globe K version of sh gamut, then uh, there's an option called minus h opt, and it will do that automatically for you as you go across. So the, uh, and again, the final output from the globe k itself is what are called .org files, and these are actually, again, ASCII files that you can read, 
And uh, those contain the final resolved positions of your sites as you go across. And from those, we can extract time series. And these, these days, we call those the pos files. You'll notice sort of the evolution here, by the way, is that uh, globe K tended to get written. Uh, it started its development later than gamut. And it developed it on a, uh, a system which actually had extents on file names. <laughs> and so it tends to use extents on file names to, to reference things, whereas gamut tends to use the first letter of things as we go across. So the uh, pos files and then velocity files, which we typically call .vel files. So the, last, the logistics of running gamut. So this is what everybody's going to do when they start running the tutorial. When you start fresh, the very first thing you do is you set up a, a directory where you're going to do your processing. And that should be separate from where you installed the software. So just think of it as applications over here, data processing over here. Often that's where you have the big disk with all the data space. The applications might be on a smaller disk someplace else, for example. The first thing you do is you run this thing called SH setup. And this is actually very simple. All it does is you typically give it the year that you're processing. And generally, we process by year uh, because there are certain files that are tagged by year. And so this SH sets it up for this specific year. It creates a set of directories that you are going to need automatically. And then it links various files that you need, like the OTL. This is the Ocean Title Loading Grid. This is one thing in the installation you always have to be careful. It's a very, very massive file. So you have to download it separately from downloading the package, because it's 800 megabytes. And in theory, you can run without it. Um, actually, I did work out why it didn't run last night. I forgot. There's two things you have to change. Uh, anyway, so you ha it does all these links for you as you go across. Uh, you then need a place where you're going to put your Rhinex data. By convention, we call that the Rhinex directory, just Rhinex. And uh, so if you have your own local data, you put it in that. And so there's also then publicly available Rhinex will be FTP typically into that directory as you go. Then you have to prepare and verify what's called station.info. Now we distribute this version, a, a version of this file. And it contains the information about all of the IG, all the sites in the world that we actually process. So there's about 3,000 stations in that. But your stations we don't know about. So you have to prepare your entries to do that. If your Rhinex files have been created correctly, which means that they have the official names for the antennas and the receivers that are officially blessed by the IGS, then you can run this shell script called sh update stimfo. And that will actually update the station information file and put your entries in. When you run the example case, you will see this happen. You will actually do this step by step as you step through the example. That's worthwhile doing as you go across. You can prepare and verify your a priori coordinate file. And again, we have shell scripts that you can use to do that. Uh, this actually will automatically happen if you haven't done it uh, when you run <coughs> SH gamut. Uh, and then you typically run SH gamut. Um, if you've done this correctly, then hopefully it'll work quite well. There's one other, uh, there's some files that you then need to actually set up to run SH gamut. And it's what we call a master script. So it does lots and lots of different things. If you actually look at the script, it's quite complicated as you go across. So the following files are important to verify or to edit as you go across. There is what's called the autoclean command file. Uh, one of the nice things about our data cleaner is for static stations, it's extremely universal. We've been developing it now actually for a good 28 years, 20, actually almost since from the time I arrived at MIT, it's being developed. Uh, so it's encountered many, many different bad failures of receivers. And it knows about nearly all of the bad failures that receivers can have. So we run this autoclean. We have a set script. And unless you have something very special about your data, you typically do not need to change it because it's quite robust. And it will be quite forgiving of problems in your data. But that, so if you have very short sessions of data, there's some changes you need to make to it because it's designed for 24-hour sessions. It's also designed that. If you have supposed to have 24 hours of data and you only have two hours of data, it's going to make the assumption that something went badly wrong 
and it'll probably just throw the station away. It have, doesn't have enough data if you're processing. So when you're doing short sessions, uh, you have to sort of tell it that. But generally, you do not need to change that. Process.defaults is, again, not necessary to edit, um, and very little changes you need to make to that. Uh, the uh, CES table, this controls uh, the types of experiment and observations. Again, you typically don't need to change that. Sites.defaults, this is the one that you do need to change for your processing because this is the file that tells Gamut what other stations around the world do you want to include in your processing. And so generally what we will do is we'll have a region, so we're looking at India, we will go to the map of the IGS sites around the world and we will look at those sites and say, okay, these are the ones that sort of surround our area of interest. And we'll get those site names. All you need to know is the site name and we will put that information into the uh, uh, sites.defaults file. Now those stations don't have to always exist for every one of your day's processing. We generally put more than we think we will need because IGS stations evolve with time. Sometimes they're there and sometimes they're not there later on. But you do need to get that. You need to think carefully about putting those stations in there. The uh, SIT table file, again, if you've included a number of IGS stations, you don't really need to change that. This is um, just sort of a weak constraints that we place on the solution as we go across. The station.info file, very important that you get that right. If you make a mistake in terms of a type of antenna, that you will have to go back and reprocess again when you run Gamut. And then again, Gamut on a typical 30 station network will take of order, depending on the machine you run on, one to two hours to process one day's worth of data. Once you've done that processing, manipulating it in Globe K typically takes a few seconds. So if you make a mistake back at that two hour runtime, you have to do a lot of computational reprocessing. That's why it's critical that you get the information about the stations correct as you go through. The apriary coordinate file, uh, it's also very important you get that right. We're fairly forgiving on that if you don't get it. In other words, you get bad apriary coordinates. But if you have the coordinates too far away from where the station actually is, then AutoClean is going to see these very large residuals because the data is not going to match and it's going to say, oh, very large residuals, something's wrong with this station. And this bad station, if I include it with all the other good stations, will corrupt the whole solution. And it'll say, get rid of it. And again, AutoClean is sort of designed for batch processing, particularly batch processing of continuous networks. And so losing a day of data from one station when it's continuous doesn't make too much difference. If it's your regional data processing for your campaign sites, then you want to pay more attention to that. So for campaign sites, some of the receivers, uh, generally the receivers know the coordinate of the station, but some of the receiver formats do not correctly record that information when it's put out into Rhinex. And so when you move a station from one place to the next, sometimes you end up getting the coordinates at the next station from the one before it. And depending on how fast you drive, that could be five meters away or it could be you know, several hundred kilometers away. And so you sometimes have to make sure you get that correct as you go across. And we'll talk more detail about that uh, in the upcoming lectures. So the phase processing, what actually happens you run through, when you run SH gamut, you'll see this coming through. Worthwhile to look at it at some point. Most of the time you don't worry about the details of this as you go through. But the pre-processing steps that happen is first there is this thing called SHGET orbits. This is again all done inside of SH gamut, but it can be done separately. And I think we're probably going to do it separately just to make sure that when we're actually doing processing, we're not reliant on a slow FTP connection. And so, uh, so this SH get orbits, as the name implies, it gets the satellite orbits, it gets them from the IGS. Uh, and it also prepares them with this thing called SP3 fit. And again, this I bet that we probably have several hundred scripts that do different things. And at some point it's fun, depending on what you like is fun, to actually look down that com directory I spoke about just to see the nature of the scripts that are out there. There's many, many of them uh, that do different things as you go across. The, uh, so we do the orbits. There is a thing that actually makes clock files. We do need to know the times. Again, if you're thinking about doing millimeter level precision, 
GPS satellites move at around one kilometer per second. So if you have the time wrong by a microsecond, the satellites moved by several millimeters in that microsecond. And we need that level of precision. And again, you don't need to worry about details, but we'll see this happen. It's called MakeJ. Then it's going to download any of the public data that you need from SH Rhinex. Uh, it can actually convert, um, uh, yeah, then it will convert the Rhinex into uh, the gamut's internal format, which is called MakeX, is the program that does that. It creates then a set of batch files that will uh, uh, be the things that actually get executed in the run. So then you uh, run this iteratively, that basically the uh, the batch file uses model to calculate synthetic observations. Uh, it creates the observables we need. There's two frequencies in GPS, what's called L1 and L2. In gamut uh, nomenclature, when you combine those two together to remove the very dispersive ionospheric delay of the Earth, that forms a thing we call LC, which is meant L-band corrected for the ionosphere. <clears throat> the uh, ionospheric effects on GPS are meters, can be tens of meters, can be actually up to a kilometer. When you have your little handheld GPS and your phone, or just as a standard single frequency GPS receiver that you can buy for about two or three hundred dollars, uh, those are good to about five to ten meters, and much of that error is due to the ionospheric delay. And then to step up to get dual frequency receivers, that's when you step from $500 to $30,000. Part of the reason you step the $30,000 is because of the proprietary patented techniques that are needed to track the second frequency. Those things are going away. The new GPS satellites, about half the GPS constellation now, transmits on the second frequency in a mode that can be easily tracked. So in a few years time, you will see the quality of $30,000 receivers now, those receivers will cost you probably less than $1,000. So that's one of the things to keep in mind that in the next few years, you are going to potentially see this massive amount of millimeter level quality GPS equipment for very, very substantially less than you're paying right now for them. So it's a, uh, something to keep in mind of thinking about how you might want to do things in the future. So the iterative solution, that creates this LC observable. The cleaning of it is done with autoclean. Then the fitting of that and perimeter estimation is weighted least square solution done with a program called Solve. And then this potentially gets um, iterated. Uh, it gets iterated once for GPS so that we can uh, correct the correct uh, noise models. And then uh, if needed, you can do it if some of the coordinates are bad as we go across. So again, this all happens automatically. You can do it uh, step by step if you wish to. And at some point, that's worth doing if you really want to understand how these things actually work. Post-processing step. So you've that gamut run, SH gamut. We're going to do three or four years worth of data, three or four days per year, maybe a week or so per day. It'll be divided among different students. So you'll each get your little chunk of data. So that's the daily processing. You're each going to do that. And that's the nice thing. That can actually be done in parallel. And that's actually the way we do our processing right now, is we run that in parallel. So when we do 2,000 stations for 24 hours, it takes us just a couple of hours because we run it on 32 different computers simultaneously. Um, and that's the nice way this sort of sets up to work. So once you've done that, then you want to bring it all back together and start combining it together. That's the course. Uh, Globe K step. So the first thing that happens is you convert these ASCII H files from Globe K into a binary format, and that's called H to global. Uh, we also tend to put that in a particular directory structure. We'll talk about that a little later on. You then just generate a list of those binary files you want to combine. Um, and then what you do next depends on precisely what you want to achieve. And we're going to talk more about that later on. Uh, but basically, there is uh, the process that will do time series analysis that allows you to look at how the positions evolve and what the accuracy and the quality of the positioning is. And then there is the combination that puts everybody together and outputs things like velocity estimates directly. 
And so those are the sort of the two main ways we do things uh, with Globe K. And we'll talk about those later. These, again, also tend to iterate. When you're doing a local network, you will find that we have coordinates. One of the biggest things that affects GPS is loading phenomena and also sort of systematic errors that come from the GPS satellite orbits. So the satellites are up at 20,000 kilometers altitude. So over the whole of India, you see a group of stations. GPS has the characteristics. You see the same group every day. They shift by about four minutes each day. And if there's an error in the orbits on one of those satellites, it'll be quite systematic across the whole of India. And then by the time it gets around to the other side of the world, it'll be different. But so any orbit errors will tend to affect all the stations in a spatially correlated way. And we call that basically spatially correlated noise. And so when you really want to look at a smaller region, something say maybe a few hundred kilometers across, then you can actually do much better by focusing locally on that region because that common mode error from the orbits goes away when you do that, or largely goes away when you do that. And so the, uh, the idea is that you want to be able to select that frame. And then having done that, you then want to go back and regenerate the time series in that new frame. Because now that common mode error is going to be much lower in the time series. That gives you a much better indication of the quality of individual data. So that's the iterative sort of thing that you do with Globe K to try to get most out of your data as you go across. There is a batch shell script called SHGO red that can sort of run all those commands above. Um, I must admit, I do not actually use it, <laughs> the, primarily because uh, it's nice, but it's a bit formulaic. And again, as I said, the, what you want to do in Globe K is often much more subtle than that. You want to change things in that. So I find it's always better just to understand what you are doing in Globe K. And if you're doing batch-oriented things, then you can set up your own tailored shell script. But there's nothing wrong with looking at what this shell script does. It will tell you definitely steps that you need to go through as you go across. So as I said, SHGenl is a generic script. Most users ultimately develop their own to put the pieces together uh, to go to time series, to do the plots of the time series and things like that. But we will look at SHGL red um, as we go through. So the Globe K um, short-term combination types of things you might want to do. This is where you want to combine uh, over a period of time in which the velocities are negligible effect. And so we do this as a couple of different ways. Sometimes this is just individual days. But if you're doing campaign GPS where you go out for a, a session where you may be out in the field for two weeks, moving around to different places during that two week period, when you come back, what you would like to do, and it's a very common practice with campaign style, is you take all your two weeks worth of data and you combine it all together to generate one survey result for that whole two weeks. It gives you the average position for the times when you were in that for the two weeks together. And you then can use that averaged block later on when you want to combine it with many other blocks uh, to put things together as we go across. So those short-term sorts of things uh, to do, uh, you, you know, sort of reduce some of the short-term scatter when you do that. And certainly when you're moving forward in time, you have less uh, files that you have to carry through as you go. So you can do that. You can generate uh, time series plots. Um, there's also, a, again, all of these high-level scripts call other lower-level scripts. There's one called shplotpos, which um, plots the time series plots using this GMT. Uh, you identify any outliers, etc. This is, again, part of the analysis step. Uh, and when you do this, when we talk about the Globe K, the way it works, you give it commands, and then based on what you tell it, it decides what you want to do. And in particular, to estimate coordinates of things, you give it this command called APR, I for your uncertainty, northeast up. So you basically tell Globe K, this is the uncertainties in my positions a priori that I have. And then you give it a site name, but Globe K has this ability to use the word all, which means it'll take all the sites. And then it's the northeast up uncertainties in meters. And then the final three estimates are the uncertainties in the velocities in meters per year. So when you're doing these short-term combinations, you're saying there is no one, the velocity is not important, so you just say zero. 
So what this does is just estimate positions and sets up a set of individual uh, coordinates for that. So the smallest globe k command file you can create is one which only has this line in it. And that will work. It'll do a lot of other things by default when it does it, but that is the simplest globe k command file. It's not going to give you a particularly interesting answer per se, because the reference frame is not resolved yet. But if you were to look at the baseline lengths from this, which you would need to add one more command to do, uh, you would find actually that looked pretty good for most of this site you're doing. So we're going to find we expand from that one line to actually do a reasonable solution. We add a few other lines to help do that. And we'll talk about that as we go through today, uh, through the rest of this class here. So globe k long-term velocities, in some sense, the only big change you need to make to globe k to do that you should just simply tell it now that the velocities are uncertain. And the typical number we use is about one meter per year. And so, uh, in fact, these days we tend to have a single globe k command file that does both of these solutions. And we'll see when we look at globe k, there's a way you can put an option of what commands you want to execute. And so it's a, and it just saves you a lot of overhead since many of the command files, well, many blocks of them are the same. And so it just allows you an easy way of doing, having one file that allows multiple things to be done. So again, when you've done this, you'd look at your combined solutions, have a look at the time series, make sure everything looks linear, you haven't neglected a, uh, an earthquake, or that someone didn't, if it was campaign data, didn't actually set up at the wrong location, and so it's actually two meters away from where it should be. You get rid of all of that sort of thing by looking at the time series and plotting them up. Uh, and again, you can identify, we'll talk about how you actually get rid of outliers as you go, okay. And then you would run globe K, estimating velocities, and the big change is, as I said, you just tell it that the velocities are uncertain at one meter per year. And you can do this in that original solution with one day of data, but if you have a week's worth of data and you tell it the velocities are uncertain, it can't really determine. It'll give you estimates that just be very, very uncertain. So this doesn't make sense until you have multiple years of data as you go across. And again, as I said, SH, um, uh, SHGL Red is capable of doing all those individual short time series things together. The velocity solutions tend to be something you want to do by yourself. Okay, so SH gamut, the operation of gamut itself. The control is through, again, a set of scripts as we go through. And again, that critical information is that GPS is metadata for the stations what the antenna and receiver types are. I can't emphasize that enough. You have to get that correct. Uh, and again, it's not that the system fails. Well, if you give it a type of an antenna that doesn't exist, it will fail. <laughs> so we, there's only certain types of antennas we know about. And that's, uh, so if you get that wrong, then it'll fail. But if you get the wrong type of antenna, if you have a, um, a Trimble Zephyr antenna without a ground plane, this is one which has a ground plane, then the answer you get is going to be wrong by a few millimeters. And that's what you have to be very, very careful of. Because that's difficult to detect, depending on what you're doing here. Uh, you need of all the a priori uh, coordinates for the stations, etc. And again, we have ways of doing that. You need to think about how you want to treat the atmospheric delay estimation. Again, for most um, studies, people just take the default. That works perfectly well. But if you're interested in very specific things or you're interested in very close separated, very closely spaced sites where the atmospheric delay is likely to be common across all the sites, you might want to rethink about uh, how to modify that as you go across. Um, there's file names and names are, are very restrictive in gamut. So there's types of file names that are expected and they're of a certain format and you sort of have to use that. Um, and, um, and then the commands often are very uh, formatted. The station.info, for example, is a very formatted file. If you get the columns wrong, or you use a tab character instead of spacing it, the file will not read correctly. And generally, that generates what we call a fatal error, if you can't read the file the way it's supposed to be read. Um, so uh, again, because of the large continuous processing that is done out there, uh, once SH gamut is set up and run, then typically after that, it is a fairly transparent process. It, provided your FTP doesn't fail on you and everything else works, uh, it should work fine as we go across. And again, typically one day of data at a time, 
Typically, 50 to 60 stations is about the maximum that we would do. I think we run about, I think we are global, net, yeah, our global network at the moment. We run about 60, uh, we run 65 stations in six, in seven different networks uh, to get up this number of stations that we have for the processing that we do. And again, typically that takes about two to three hours to process on a modern, you know, two to three gigahertz um, pen, um, you know, processor, Intel, Core, whatever. Um, on a modern core machine where you might have, I'm not sure what the machines you have are, but these days, you know, typically computers come with 24 cores. Uh, we found that with 24 cores, the processing, you can typically run maybe half those cores uh, all at the same time. The, the pre problem you have is disk output, disk input and output. Um, but in most of the machines that we have, that seems to work pretty well. That uh, you can load up most of the cores um, and they, they will process parallel as you go through. Uh, again, you, there's some things you have to be a bit careful of in uh, disk space. Okay, so the operation of Globe K. In gamut, things are quite um, dictated as to how you go. Globe K is a much more free form process. And so for example, when you set up gamut, the, the basic files, you need to do everything. We give you all of those files. We give you templates for Globe K. But again, typically you have to do more modification because it's going to be very specific on what you want to actually process, which stations you're using, which you consider to be good stations, et cetera, as you go across. So you have to be, um, it takes a little bit of time to get through that as you go across. Uh, the command files for Globe K um, are generally simple, but they do need to be tailored for your specific program. Uh, single day processing is very, very fast, typically a few seconds. Uh, velocity solutions with large numbers of stations over many, many years, can take a reasonable amount of time. I, we're not going to encounter that with this. The solutions we run with Globe K on this, where you have just a couple of local stations, half a dozen IGS stations, a few years, a couple of days per year, that literally will take maybe uh, less than 10 seconds to run. But the big runs we do, we now have something like, for the Plate Boundary Observatory in the US, we have maybe 3,000 total stations spanning 20 years worth of daily data, with daily files. Uh, those runs actually now take about one week and actually we have special uh, subnetting of those runs to speed them up because if we tried to run them they would take a very very long time. Okay, well good. So summary. So the basic concepts is that, whoops, oh the rocket actually just worked. Ah, it was the wrong set of keys. <laughs> uh, never can get back to where it was. Okay, summary. Uh, so the, uh, yeah, so Gamut produces these daily position estimates from the raw GPS and GNSS data. Globe K combines things together to get to your final analysis results. In the latest sessions, we're going to talk in more detail about those important files that we need to do. And critical uh, in all the processing is the Unix environment. We we're having a chat to someone about Windows and why we hate Windows. <laughs> uh, there's actually a historical uh, reason having to do with the way Gamut developed and the way it separated from its commercial. You'll notice Gamut is, I think it's the only open, it's the only program where you get source code that is free. Um, and that is the reason that is we actually separated from our commercial partner back in 1980. But that separation when we did it back then was basically that the academic community would stay on the Unix platform and the commercial community would stay on the Windows platform. So we actually signed an agreement saying we would not put Gamut on a uh, Windows machine. And uh, now that company that actually we signed that with has, I think went belly up many, many years ago, went broke. But we still stick to that and that's why we're not doing it. Uh, <laughs> the, the fundamental reason is it's so embedded in Unix now that trying to shift is a, much, is a very expensive process. And in our mind, it's much more important that we do things like uh, work with the GNSS system, GLONASS, even the, uh, the Indian system, system IRNS, um, which poses its own interesting problems because of the S-band data. Uh, <laughs> um, but we think that's more important development than trying to make it Windows friendly. And Windows these days also, as I said, tends to be sort of moving a little in the unix -y world. So you need to learn something about Unix and command line. And for people who have done a lot of Windows stuff with years, that takes a little bit of getting used to as we go across. Okay, so that's the main summary. Now there's more in this lecture about 
the Unix environment. But since I said I would speak for an hour, uh, you can take oh no, actually, there's another <laughs> there's another whole hour of lecture. Well, that, in the second half? Yeah, we could do that. Uh, yeah, if you like, we could do that, or we could actually take questions. I didn't hear yeah, questions. The, the, the session for our question. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, if I understood correctly, hmm? one minute. You have to repeat his question so that those who are uh, listening it may understand what. Okay. 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 So uh, as you said, that baselines are very correct to maybe submillimeter level. Uh, may I know what's the logic for that? Because uh, if I understood it correctly, orientations are of the axis. Reference systems are not appropriate. But is it like that? The center, that origin itself, is very correct. Is it like that? No, the question has to do with why the baselines are well determined, yes. but the coordinates are not exactly. well determined. Exactly. And the reason fundamentally is that we do not, the orientation of the Earth itself, so the satellites are orbiting in inertial space. The Earth itself, as it rotates, the rotation axis of the Earth moves by about 10 meters over a year. And we do not know what that motion is. Now, the group called the International Earth Rotation Service yeah. does estimates on that based on mm -hmm. GPS data. <laughs> That's where the primary, for the position of the Earth's rotation pole at the moment, GPS is the fundamental place that comes from. Mm -hmm. So uh, we could uh, basically adopt the IERS values for the Earth orientation, but those are all done in what's called a no net rotation reference frame. And so for what you're doing, that may not be appropriate. Mm -hmm. And so if you just simply rotate the coordinates of something, the baseline lengths do not change. Yeah. And the translation on the system is actually much more subtle because GPS is an Earth orbiting system. Mm -hmm. And in theory, it is that you can actually determine the origin of the frame from those orbits. Right. However, GPS also has very large solar panels mm -hmm. with a lot of radiation force on them that we do not model well. And so we estimate parameters associated with those. When we do that, it actually takes away our certainty in where the origin is. And so a uh, typical, what we would call a loose orbit solution in GPS, you may actually have errors of several centimeters in the origin. Mm -hmm. So that whole translation and rotation but under both of those frames, the baseline lengths do not change. Because you rotate, translate, that's an invariant in that course, so the angles between the baselines don't change either. So that's, so in a sense, what Globe is trying to exploit is that strength to then adopt a coordinate system which has certain characteristics that matches us to a system that we want to achieve. And it does it by rotation and translation. Okay. Okay. Uh, one. One more question I have. So I just said that gamut takes 24 hours of data, one day data, and process it. Right. So uh, uh, gamut. And then you use such data sets to process in the globe K. Right. Right. So should I say that globe K can take the data, which is already processed by one day every day, let's say, and let's say if I'm doing for 60 days, for example, two months. So should I say that it will be having a kind of two months data, which is already processed by the gamut every day? So it has this, is it this kind of setup, if I'm right? Yes, it's the idea of being this sort of multiple ways we use Globe K. Mm -hmm. But the standard would be um, that you have, for what we're going to process, what's your? So the question is, that, again, that relationship between the one day and the 60 sort of days worth of data. When you combine 60 days in Globe K is a little bit too short to do a velocity solution. But if we made it 10 years worth of data, mm -hmm then globe K would be the way we would blend, put all that data together to come up with the velocity estimates. Mm -hmm. Now, the subtlety here is that you would say, well, why don't I just take the time series and fit linear lines to those time series? We will look at that solution later on in this class. And that turns out these days actually to be quite a good solution. Mm -hmm. But to generate the time series, you need the reference frame that you want to use. Right. And so if you have a local reference frame you want to use, it is Globe K combined together 
that allows you to generate that reference frame coordinate set. And then you can generate the time series from that. And if you do that, then you find the velocity estimates you get by the simple least squares fit right. to the lines is uh, qu quite close to globe K. We will talk later, mm -hmm. but when you're doing velocities, a really important thing to realize is that there is temporal correlation mm -hmm. in all GPS results. So uh, when you do weighted least squares with what's called a white noise data assumption, which is very commonly used, you will end up with very optimistic estimates for the uncertainties on your velocities. Right. And so one of the really important parts of modern GPS analysis in understanding your velocities is accounting for that correlated noise mm -hmm. in the data sets as you go across. So you want to, so Globe K can also do that. That's why it's a common filter. Okay. It has process noise models right, right, embedded right. in it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Please feel free to ask, because uh, the more you ask, the more the lab will be less you know. Yeah. Don't be shy. Huh? I don't bite yeah, because, that uh, much. Uh, I just want to say a few things, because I know some of you are reading this or listening to this for a time, but, but uh, the process is so uh, in a step manner, you have to follow certain steps, then the files will be prepared accordingly. You don't need to worry about the, the steps or anything. Everything is prepared accordingly. And second thing is, every file which is, which is being prepared for your uh, so-called laboratory, whatever files you are preparing for the further process, all are well documented. You can read it. Isn't it? So, and second thing, the basics, which is, which is, uh, which uh, Professor Hanil is saying that you need to uh, understand the frames and everything. We will cover in day by day. Hopefully today we will have uh, the first lecture on the coordinate system and time system and frames. So that will give little more basics. Some of you are already aware of those frames and coordinate system, but some of you are not. Some of you are from simple, uh, the, the basic background. So we'll cover that. So any more questions on this? Is this just a question, sir? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Sir, I'm not asking you. Yeah, <laughs> Completely basic questions. Like, yeah. I'm not yeah. able to understand what exactly is time series and uh, those things. So, so that will look out afterwards, right? Yeah. Yeah. Individual set of coordinates yeah. you get for a location. And to Eurasia, the time series sequence of values that you go through, and then. And Okay, and gamma, the whole thing is to essentially take your own data and then realize that if this that's not really to the Himalayan front. There's elastic strain accumulation push its way underneath there without having major earthquakes. So often what you're interested in accumulating. You can have multiple faults. You will find pretty much as a rigid block. But then as you get closer to the Himalayas, you'll find that you'll start seeing things on individual spots and trying to use one to understand how strain is accumulating, to make a prediction of what the seismic risk is in that area. And some of the big faults we know about, the main Himalayan thrust we know about, but it's the little things that we don't know about. 
Uh, you might have uh, heard of the big earthquakes that happened in New Zealand, in Canterbury. Again, that set of earthquakes happened in a region which was not particularly close to the major faults in the region. However, that region, there had been elastic strain accumulation noticed before. So there was an indication that there was buildup of elastic energy that would be released in an earthquake in that region based on geodetic data. So much of the geodetic analysis is aimed at seeing how things are deforming and then trying to understand whether that is actually a, um, an elastic strain accumulation that's going to be released as quick, or is it simply sliding? And so, you know, you have certain faults which do what they call creep. So the fault doesn't actually have big earthquakes. It just simply moves along. It just creeps as it goes along. And again, precise geodetic measurements across that fault allow you to assess how much of it is creeping, if it is what they call locked, to what depth is it locked, and on what rate is it accumulating strain. And a you know, really simple back of the envelope calculation you do then is that a really big earthquake will have five to 10 meters of slip on it. If you have something moving at 10 millimeters per year, accumulating that, that means that it's gonna release that every 50 to 100 years. And so that's the, that's the simple calculation. Now, we don't know precisely when that's going to happen, but that risk potential is allows you to then say, well, I'd better put infrastructure in place expecting this. And again, these days, many of the, you know, the big faults we understand, what we really worry about now is the small things that maybe happen once every thousand years. So once every thousand years, means you don't have the historical reference that that earthquake happens. And so it comes out of the blue. It's like the New Madrid earthquakes in the middle of the US that happened in the 1870s. Those were, ma well, they were massive earthquakes and they've happened once. We think now those probably happen once every thousand, every 2,000 years. And so those places where you don't have that historical record, that's some of the power of this. The other aspect of this, which is quite critical these days, is water usage. Because when you take water out of the Earth, the surface deforms in response to that. And you might have noticed that for GRACE, the gravity missions have given us sort of big insight across the amount of water disappearing, or the fluids moving around. But there's a deformation component associated with that. So you also have to understand that, because if you're looking at the tectonics, you see something straining, maybe it's not an earthquake at all. Maybe it's the local aquifer. It's drained and you're being pulled in as a result of that. So that's, again, the analysis part. That's the complicated part of this. What we're hoping is to get the geodetic part down, that you know precisely what you're looking at, and that you would then try to understand why is it doing that. And then you have to tailor your geodetic analysis to really exploit what you want to look for. And that's the sort of globe K sort of part. That's the complexity, and it will take you years, I think, to, to really get that appreciated as to the subtleties of what's going on. Thank you. Yeah. When we are processing our observation data, observation file, if it is broken, uh, there are two files for the same day, one for first 12 hours, and second is for uh, second 12 hours. Then will S3 process it? If you have your data set to two different observation files for one single day, uh, yeah, it depends. Again, Because you can at this part of the day, and then two hours later, sometimes it's better to do the two separate processings and then combine those two together in globe K. Uh, or you can say 24 hours of data and take your two points and just have it. That's, that's a good 
exercise to see what the impact of doing that is. And again, if the data is clean, if very clean and nothing very wrong, then those two approaches will probably generate a particular answer. Very clear. There's something that's uh, maybe the big thunderstorms in one of those days, and I won't say not in the other. Then those choice, um, and I suppose uh, I would. I would probably be tempted originally to bind those together. There's a nice advantage of with common errors. When you do it that way, all those other stations only have data at the time you errors disappear. If you bring in all the data in the middle and you didn't of your own data, systematic from that are likely to affect your positions. But that's something you have to sort of work out based on your data. It turns out in SH Gamut, we can talk about it in detail later on, it's very simple in SH Gamut to set it up so that you can process three hours of data here. There's one argument you can pass when you run. It's the, um, the we normally don't give it, but you can actually tell it precisely which bit of data you actually want to process. And then there's ways you can set up the directory structure to allow that. But yeah, that's a good thing to look at. It's uh, when you have campaign data, uh, that is important. Yeah, which we have been pushing. Okay, good. Yeah, <laughs> well, we can talk about that in more detail. Uh, any more? Any more questions? Okay, so reporting time for the second half is two fifteen. Okay. But lab will start at three fifteen. So by two fifteen, three fifteen, we'll have lecture one. And in the meantime, your lab will be prepared. Thank you.